Um, the year is 1990, and the approach to treating breast cancer was one size fits all. Leap ahead by 20 years, and the revolution of individualized treatments based on genetics and biomarkers determines which treatment will be most effective. It is a movement towards customized treatments, personalized medicine that we've been hearing about all day. It is a hope for the future. So let's end with a happy ending of survivorship. It is my honor to introduce breast cancer survivor, Samantha Morgan. I work for the UW School of Medicine and Public Health. Um, there I manage a large comprehensive research agreement between the UW Radiology Department and GE Healthcare. But before that, I was a clinical research coordinator at the UW Carbone Cancer Center. And in that role, I spent my days working with cancer patients and rolled on one of our many clinical trials. Many of the patients I saw were diagnosed with late stage colon and pancreatic cancer. And these clinical trials offered them hope that doesn't normally exist for patients with a terminal diagnosis. But that wasn't where my relationship with the Cancer Center began. I'm also a patient of the Carbone Cancer Center here at UW. Three years ago in October of 2013, I was diagnosed with breast cancer at the age of 27. I was in shock. <laughs> when I called my husband Elliot to tell him the news, I could barely get a word out. But I think that that silence said just as much as words could at that moment in my life. I have no family history. I don't carry the BRCA gene. I'm a lifelong swimmer, a cyclist. I work out with a trainer once a week. I eat well, I don't smoke, and I don't drink excessively. I thought I was doing everything right to avoid such a life-threatening diagnosis. And I was also a week away from my one-year wedding anniversary with Elliot. We could never have imagined that when we stood at that altar in front of our family and friends and vowed to be there for each other in sickness and in health, that in sickness was going to come for us less than a year later. But it did, and there wasn't any changing that or avoiding it. So we knew we needed to do something, and we needed to do something fast. So on Halloween of that year, I underwent, underwent a unilateral mastectomy. And it was at that time that my surgeon discovered that the cancer had already spread to my lymph nodes. And I remember waking up in my hospital bed, um, and Elliot was there, and I looked at him, and I saw his tear-stained cheeks and his red-rimmed eyes, and I knew in that moment that our lives were never going to be the same. They were never going to be the way that we pictured them when we first met, or when Elliot kneeled down and proposed, or even as that picture evolved and we stood together and said our vows. Uh, he waited for our family and friends to leave before discussing with me what the doctors had told them, yes, the cancer had spread, and I was going to need chemotherapy and radiation treatments if I wanted to survive. So I began chemo in December of that year and continued through the holidays and into 2014. When I completed all of my chemotherapy, I moved on to radiation treatments every day for five weeks. By the time I was done with all of this, I was bald. I was sick. I was 28 years old, and I was a woman missing a breast. I had three new scars on my chest, significant discoloration of my skin where it had, been, it had been radiated, and I was exhausted. The physical exhaustion of all of that was like nothing I'd never ever felt before, but the mental exhaustion of living with cancer and fighting cancer is equally relentless. I remember looking in the mirror one morning and I had two eyelashes on one of my eyes and one eyelash on the other. And I thought to myself, way to go. You guys stuck it out to the end. <laughs> I'm sure they fell out shortly after that, but I was, I was pretty miserable. I felt humiliated. And with what little energy I had left, I hoped and prayed for the only thing I wanted in the entire world, and that was to beat cancer. And I did. I stand here today after two years of pain and loss and anger and grief and ultimately acceptance, and I can say that I am cancer-free. Thank you. And I can say I'm cancer-free because of research and the innovation of new technologies that that leads to. 
In the past, when I thought about what to say at events like this, the simple question of what does research, or why does research and innovation matter so much, always comes back to me as something fundamentally important. Uh, it's a straightforward question. I could ask each of you why it matters, and because of the work you do, or the life experiences you've had, I think each of you would answer it differently. We don't have time for each of you to answer it today, but I would like to tell you why research and innovation matters to me as a cancer patient, a cancer survivor, and someone who has worked closely with cancer patients. So why does it matter to me? I think in many ways it's obvious. I am young and I want to live a long, happy, healthy life. I want children of my own someday, and I want to watch them grow and experience new things. I want to see the world through their eyes, and I want to be there to help them when that world just doesn't seem to go their way. I want to see them graduate college and start families of their own. And I want to grow old with Elliot and see how handsome he's going to look with gray hair. I'm also curious to know if, he, if it's even possible for him to act any older than he already does. Don't tell him I said that. <laughs> but all these things that I want, none of them are guaranteed. For 27 years, I did everything I thought was right to secure my perfect, healthy, happy future, and still I got cancer. So life isn't fair, and I know we've all heard that more times than we can count. I've wrestled with that concept a lot <coughs> over the last few years, and mostly I've accepted it. It's difficult to come to terms with the life isn't fair, idea when you're the one getting a cancer diagnosis. You ask yourself a lot, why me? Why isn't life fair for some of us? But I think we have to look past that. We have to move beyond why me? Why my mother? Why my father? Why my daughter or my son? Because people are going to continue to be diagnosed with cancer. We can't change that yet. But we can make it a fair fight for our loved ones who are diagnosed. Through research, through innovation, we can develop novel treatments. We can engineer state-of-the-art equipment. We can discover medications with less side effects so that patients have a better quality of life when they're fighting this disease. 20 years ago, breast cancer wasn't nearly as survivable as it is today. But I stand here as a result of all that dedication and innovation towards finding better, more effective, more targeted treatments Right here at the University of Wisconsin, we pioneered studies to help in the development of cutting-edge therapies. Therapies such as tamoxifen, a drug that I take every day to help protect my body against a recurrence of breast cancer. There was a day when I was sitting in clinic consenting a 79-year-old woman to one of our clinical trials, and as I went through the protocol, she stopped me mid-sentence to tell me that she knew what she was getting herself into because she had volunteered for a cancer study at the UW over 20 years ago. She was a breast cancer survivor, and she had participated in the study that studied, that tested the efficacy of tamoxifen. And it was at that moment when it really clicked for me what I was doing and why I was doing it, because 20 years ago, that woman didn't know that that drug that she was being given on that study was going to benefit her. But I think she knew that participating in that study would provide researchers with the results necessary, necessary to move forward with development, production, and distribution of a life-saving drug. And here I am, two decades later, taking that drug and surviving my cancer because of her willingness to participate in that study, and because of that expertise of the researchers at the UW, and because of the innovative ideas that are out there in so many different areas of healthcare. So we are accomplishing really great things. Things that are changing people's lives, I know firsthand that they're changing my life. But we have more work to do, and it doesn't happen overnight. I wish the patients that I had worked with who were diagnosed with late-stage cancers had had the same opportunity to win the fight that I won. It's easy to get discouraged when you don't see results right away. I know I've been discouraged by what seems like a lack of progress, or just very slow progress. It's difficult to watch um, the patients that I worked with stop responding to treatment, and I would always wonder to myself, what was it all for? Was it ever going to work? Research takes time. It isn't instantly gratifying. But when we discover something new, when we make one of those breakthroughs, it's so much more than instant gratification. We have to never lose sight of the end goal because it will always be there, and progress will be made, even if it is slow. 
When I would lose sight of that, it was my patients who would remind me why we were doing it all. When I would go to consent to new patients, I would always have to tell them that we couldn't guarantee that this treatment was going to work for them. And it's hard to say to people, to look someone in the eye and tell them that this might not be the answer that's going to save them. But you know what? They never seemed to let that face them. The next thing that they would ask me was, will being on this study help someone else in the future? And that always blew me away. Because in the face of their own adversity, they were thinking about helping other people. So there's a quote I would like to share with you because I think it sums up why patients have that response and why all of us in this room do the work that we do to push the boundaries of innovation in healthcare. The quote is from a book called Just Mercy, and the author, Brian Stevenson, says, We are bodies of broken bones. I guess I'd always known, but never fully considered, that being broken is what makes us human. We all have our reasons. Sometimes we're fractured by the choices we make, and sometimes we're shattered by the things we would have never chosen. But our brokenness is also the source of our common humanity, the basis for our shared search for comfort, meaning, and healing. Our shared vulnerability and imperfection nurtures and sustains our capacity for compassion. I've learned a lot about cancer over the last years, the last three years. I've learned the science of it, the innovative treatments for it, the peculiarities of each new individual diagnosis. But what I've learned that is most paramount to me is that cancer binds you to a new community. And this community is composed of fighters, survivors, doctors, researchers, family, friends, all of who are brought together by their unwillingness to let cancer win. The most amazing thing about this community is that it isn't jealous or spiteful or cruel. And in a world where I think that we're plagued by hateful words and acts, it's kind of rare. This community is full of love and hope, and I believe that this community, that all of this, us in this room are a part of, can do amazing things if we continue to believe in it. So why does research matter to me? Because I'm broken. Cancer broke me, but in doing so, it made me a fierce fighter. While I may, not be, while I may be done fighting my own battle, I will never get up, give up fighting for a better future for all cancer patients. I'm standing up to cancer because a day doesn't go by when I don't remember each and every patient that I met. And the ones who beat it, and for the ones who are no longer with us, I'm fighting for them. They're the reason I'm here today, so that someday the celebration of cancer survivors will outweigh the pain of losing them. So I want to say thank you for having me and for listening to my story. Thank you for the work you're doing to transform the future of cancer diagnosis, treatment, and survival. All of you here are part of the community that I speak of, and I truly believe that cancer will cease to exist as we know it. Thank you.